We're in Deuteronomy 11, 22. For if you'll observe this entire commandment that I command you to perform it, to love Hashem your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave to him, Hashem will drive out all these nations from before you, and you, uh, you shall drive out greater and mightier, nation, uh, mightier nations than yourselves. And we're talking about this word to cleave. And to help define it, um, Ramban cites Joshua 23, 8, which says to cleave to Hashem your God as you have done up to this day. And we talked about what cleaving means last week. This week, we're picking up where we left off, and Ramban is here explaining. What's up, Brian? We're in Deuteronomy 11, 22, and 23. But we're in a tiny segue to Joshua 23, 8. Mm -hmm. She says, only, only cleave to Hashem your God as you have done up to this day. This is Josh, you know, Joshua's leading the people of Israel to conquer the land of Canaan. And this statement is a little strange because Ramban's just described the idea of cleaving to God as being at a level where you're always thinking about God. You're always, you know, you're never thinking about anything else. And that this is um, a really high level of spirituality. But then Joshua says, you know, cleave to God, just like you always have been doing to like the mm -hmm. whole nation. And we know that they weren't all doing that because they made a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So Ramban has to explain why Joshua worded this sentence that way. Ramban says, as far as what Joshua said, as you have done up to this day, this is because as long as they were in the wilderness, the cloud of God hovering over them, and the manna descending from heaven, the quail coming up, and the well that followed them, and all these things were always happening, and their, their affairs were conducted by the hand of heaven through miraculous means. Well, their thoughts and deeds were with God constantly. And that's why Joshua warned them that now in the land that these wondrous deeds had ceased, they, they still need to um, try to keep their inner thoughts cleaved to the esteemed and awesome name that their attention should not depart from God. All right, verse 24. Every place where the sole of your foot will tread shall be yours from the wilderness in the Lebanon, from the river, the Euphrates River, until the Western Sea shall be your boundary. No man will stand up against you. Hashem, your God, will set your terror and fear on the entire face of the earth where you will tread as he spoke to you. In Deuteronomy 11, we just read verse 25. So, um, Sifre, Ramban says that Sifre, the ancient Jewish commentary, gets a couple of different promises from these verses. This idea that every place where the sole of your foot will, will tread shall be yours, they took um, literally, meaning that the Jewish people at some point in the future decide they want to conquer some other country, then that uh, country will be annexed into the land of Israel. And after that, when it starts to delineate a, a location, that that's, that's the part that they are obligated to conquer. As they're driving, as, they're, as they're, it's the definition of the land of Canaan that they're going in to conquer. Mm -hmm. Now, God assures them that as they're conquering that place, uh, that also there, every place where the sole of their foot will tread will be theirs. But Ramban brings up an interesting dispute among the uh, some earlier sages. I think in the, the Talmud. <coughs> about this idea that the land of Israel can be expanded. And it's an important halakhic issue because the halakha says that there are many commandments that only apply within the land of Israel. You only have to tithe on produce grown in the land of Israel. You only have to separate teruma from produce grown in the land of Israel. And so forth. 
So if the land of Israel, if, if the definition of where that land is, or like how big it is, changes, there, there, it may be that it stays changed uh, for all time. And the, the, the sages in the Talmud argue about this, uh, about a land called Syria, which is just uh, the ancient, ancient name for Syria. Um, they're not exactly the same borders as Syria today. It's, it's around there. It's within that country. And the, the argument goes, well, you know, King David conquered this area. So you might think it should be part of the land of Israel halakhically, meaning that produce, if a Jewish person is growing produce in that area, you know, they would have to tithe and separate to Ruma. However, he didn't ask the Urim and Tumim, which is the way, the way that if you, uh, you know, a king of Israel would, would um, ask God something like, should I, something specific, like they all, they already had the Torah. They knew that ge the general idea of the, the life that, uh, that God had called them to. But if they had something specific they wanted to ask, like, should I go to war with these people or, uh, you know, like a yes or no uh, question by some interpretations, by other interpretations, they could ask whatever they wanted and the Urim and Tumim could give any answer. But the Urim and the Tumim are something that the, that the high priests had and they would, they, uh, God would make them glow or, or something, you know, whether it's letters on the breastplate would, would uh, glow or some, some uh, interpretations of it as being like two, um, like rocks or something. Then uh, it was sort of like casting lots. The high priest would pull out one or the other and that would be the yes or the no. Anyway, David didn't ask God before he went on, on this uh, campaign to Syria to conquer it, he didn't consult the Sanhedrin. He just did it. He just did it because he wanted to. And because he had not actually driven out all the seven nations from this defined area here of the, the promised land, then Syria is not part of, of the land of Israel because yes. you're, he, he was supposed to, to finish conquering the promised land first and only afterward is it okay to proceed and conquer some other land. Mm -hmm. So some of the sages say the conquest was not undertaken in accordance with the dictate of the Torah and it did not have the status of a valid con uh, conquest. So it's biblically, it's like territory outside the land with regard to commandments that are obligations of the land. But some sages say that it is a valid conquest and Someone living in that area today, if they're Jewish, would have to treat it as part of the land of Israel. I don't know what the who's right there, but it's interesting. It's an interesting question. <laughs> this is uh, that's the end of the portion we were in. We're going into Parsha uh, Re, -e, which is C. So the C uh, S E E, an imperative verb. Verse 26 of Deuteronomy chapter 11. See, I present before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, when you hearken to the commandments of Hashem, your God, that I command you today, and the curse, if you do not hearken to the commandments of Hashem, your God, and you stray from the path that I command you today to follow the gods that you did not know. It shall be that when Hashem, your God, brings you to the land to which you come to possess it, then you shall deliver the blessing on Mount Gerizim, the curse on Mount Eval. This word deliver is kind of interesting. It looks like it's the same root as the word that we, uh, is often translated um, give. It can mean uh, to place something somewhere. It, but it can mean to give someone something. But um, it's odd in this context um so Ramban feels like he needs to explain what this word means in this context Rashi also felt the need to explain it Rashi thought it meant well it's uh the meaning of the word is to place something somewhere so you're going to place the people who say the blessing on Mount Gerizim instead of placing the blessing on Mount Gerizim you're going to place the people who bless uh, because later we're going to learn that the way that this is going to happen is that they're going to put people on the mountains and they're going to say the blessings and the curses. Mm -hmm. 
Ramban says, well, this is not very sound because we don't know about those people yet. Moses had not yet commanded that there be specific individuals who would give the blessing. Rather, the explanation is that uh, Moses is saying, see, I am presenting before you today a way by which to attain blessing and a way by which to attain a curse. It's the same verb in the in verse 26, the beginning of verse 26. Um, Anuchi no ten. Right? This is the same word. This it's noon tav noon. It's the same Hebrew root when we do the bracha before the study when Dad says, "Bukhat Hashem no ten haTorah." That's giver of the Torah. And so this is, see, I give you today a blessing and a curse, or I present before you, or I place before you. Okay. So they're, so they're going to, um, so this is just repeating the verb from the beginning of the passage. So, so Jacob, it, we're saying, see, I am setting before you today, I am giving you today would be a way to interpret that then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm yep. <laughs> and the explanation of before you, because you don't usually say something like give before you. Ramban says the explanation of before you is that you can choose whichever of the, whichever of these two ways that you want. Ooh. Right? Moses informed them that you'll experience the blessing when you follow the commandments. You experience the curse if you do not follow them. Yeah. Now, it's, and he Raman says it's similar to a verse later in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. This is, See, I've placed before you today the life and the good and the death and the evil. Mm. So, after that, after verses 26 to 28, he says that they should place this blessing with, about which he's now telling them on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Eval. And now this placing mentioned in our verse is an oral pronouncement, just like the placing in the verse, and he shall place them on the head of the he-goat. Leviticus 16, I think, talking about placing of sins. In, in accordance with the words of Rabbi Abraham, Ibn Ben Ezra. So Ibn Ezra must have gotten this right. And thus Moses was saying here in the course of the warning he was giving, they should place the blessing on Mount Gerizim to bless the people if they would hearken to the commandments of Hashem and the curse on Mount Eval saying, cursed be he who does not hearken to the commandments and strays from the path God has commanded. So this giving the blessing on Mount Gerizim or placing the blessing on Mount Gerizim, whatever, however you translate it, Ramban says, well, it means that there's going to be an oral pronouncement on that mountain. Now, Moses is going to come back to this in chapter 27 and say again, uh, the whole thing about Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval. Raman is going to explain that. However, based on just, this, the, just the instructions in this passage, you, you could still be possible that maybe all the tribes would give the blessing and all of them would go over to Mount Eval and give the curse, or maybe just the Levites should do it, or just pick the loudest person, you know, pick one guy who, to just shout from the mountain. Um, it wasn't clear exactly who should be doing this yet. So after, uh, you know, in, in uh, chapter 27, Moses comes back and elaborates and says exactly who's going to stand on Mount Gerizim, who's going to stand on Mount Eval. That's why he had to return to it at that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. He says it's plausible to surmise that Mount Gerizim is to the south, which is called the right side, and Mount Eval is to the north, for from the north the evil begins. Talked a little bit about this before. Mystical idea. Well, first of all, there's just a regular, the regular Hebrew way of talking about directions. It assumes you're staring at the rising sun or looking at in the direction at, from which the sun rises. So you know, to the right is the south, to the left is the north. Um, the left side is always in like Jewish mysticism, not as good necessarily. I mean, maybe like in Kabbalah, it's necessary to have a, a right and a left side for 
for balance, but you you would prefer the right side um, to overwhelm the left side. Because the right side is the side of mercy. When you're talking about the sephirot, the right the right sephirot are the sephirot that constitute mercy generally, and on the left side you find the ones that are withholding mercy or even you know something bad coming down, uh, some judgment. So from from the north, from the left, if you're looking east, from the north, the evil begins, you know, that sort of a, goes hand in hand with that mystical idea that bad things come from the north. Jacob, which way is he facing for the but right and the left? You, you, when you're facing east, ah. uh, if, you, if you're talking about directions like right and left, um, it's assuming, it. It's, it assumes you're facing east. Yeah, that helps a lot. I, I've often wondered about that. Okay. Next. Uh, 30. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan, far in the direction of the sunset in the land of the Canaanite that dwells in the plain, far from Gilgal near the plains of Moray? For you are crossing the Jordan to come and possess the land that Hashem your God gives you. You shall possess it and you shall settle in it. You shall be careful to perform all the decrees and the judgments that I present before you today. Here again we have decrees and judgments. Chukim and um, Mishpatim. And this, Ooh, these are um, decrees are commandments. Again, de decrees are commandments or... Um, Chukim are commandments that for which we don't know the explanation. There might be an explanation, but God never revealed the explanation to us. Like, don't weave a garment from two different uh, types of fabric or from wool and linen together, uh, specifically. And then you've got um, judgments, which are laws that have to do with monetary compensation to the offended party if you break those uh, laws. Yes, it's for so for very different reasons a person might specifically not want to do those kinds of of uh, laws they might think i don't want to pay damages or they might think i don't understand this so i don't want to do it so sometimes those are mentioned but it doesn't mean to the exclusion of all the other commandments it's just because those are the ones people tend most to, to not want to do um, that sometimes they're mentioned specifically. So you have to be more careful to make sure you're doing them. All right. Chapter 12. These are the decrees and the judgments that you shall observe to perform in the land of Hashem, the God of your forefathers has given you to possess it all the days that you live on the land. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations that you were driving away worshipped their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every leafy tree. You shall break apart their pillars, you shall smash their pillars, or break apart their altars, you shall smash their pillars, and their sacred trees you, uh, shall you burn in the fire. Their carved images shall you cut down, and you shall obliterate their names from that place. You shall not do this to Hashem your God. Rather, only at the place Hashem your God will choose from among all your tribes to place his name there, shall you seek out his presence and come there. So this is a weird dichotomy. If you just read through verse 4, you would think, well, the thing we're not supposed to do to Hashem is utterly destroy all the places where he's worshipped, break apart his altars, smash apart his pillars, burning his sacred trees and carved images. Well, he doesn't need to have all those things. Um, but if you look at verse 5, rather only at the place Hashem your God will choose from among the tribes to place his name there, shall you seek out his presence and come there. It almost looks like it means don't build altars and plant sacred trees and make carved images for Hashem. If you, but if you just take like the last tiny bit of verses one through three, you might take it to mean that you're not supposed to obliterate God's name. You might just just relate it to that last that last mm -hmm. phrase. So it's so we're going to see what Ramban. Um, thinks this verse is referring to. He starts by quoting Rashi. Rashi says, you shall not do this to Hashem your God means 
don't burn sacrifices to God wherever you want, rather only at the place God will choose. Or, still Rashi, Rashi gives a second possibility. It might mean the thing about smashing altars and obliterating the names. And don't, don't do things like that to Hashem, your God. So it's a prohibition directed to one who might be thinking about erasing the name of God or breaking apart a stone uh, from the uh, temple courtyard or something like that. Now, this is from Sifre again. And you know, Sifre is uh, many times a conversation between several rabbis. And after this, you know, the Tanakama, the guy who, who, who uh, it's just a name for the guy who starts the conversation, he usually doesn't have it, he's not, he's, he's not always named. But um, Rabbi Yishmael responded to that guy and said, You out of your mind? What Jew would go break apart the altar of Hashem? What it means is you should not imitate the deeds of the Canaanites because if you do, your sins will cause the temple to be destroyed by somebody else. So huh. Ramban says, all right, yes, if right, good. Rabbi Ishmael's words, though, are uh, agada, agada. So they're not, they're not halacha. It's not a, he's not, this is not like a legal ruling. This is a, this is like a more colorful or, you know, it's like an, a, you can use an analogy or a story. Um, sometimes, you know, lore and legends. There's lots and lots of, of stuff in this category of agada. It's generally not, you know, how long should the ZT be? It's more, more um, creative interpretations or expansions of the story. And, uh, and uh, Ramban wants us to know that when you get into the halacha, the sages uh, have a consensus that this verse is indeed a prohibition on erasing the name of God. If you've ever wondered where that prohibition comes from, that uh, an observant Jew is not allowed to erase the name of God, it comes from this verse. And in order to avoid a situation in which the name of God might be erased, there's obviously lots of other things you shouldn't do, like write God's name with a dry erase marker on a, on a whiteboard. You know, these are things that you, the observant Jew would never do. Um, and even, and, you know, if, if you're printing a pamphlet or a book and you think maybe at some point someone's going to throw the book away or it's going to be ruined you wouldn't put like god's proper name you wouldn't print it in there you would use like two yodes next to each other or or, or uh, some abbreviation for a book like this that does contain the name of god printed because it has the whole has the whole torah in here in hebrew um, you know, if, if for whatever reason it, be, it became that I couldn't use it anymore, like it was radioactive, I don't know what, God forbid, something would happen to my books. It would have to be, it would have to be buried respectfully. It would have to be put away respectively or respectfully and um, not destroyed mm. because you can't erase the name of Hashem. It's a, it's a prohibition in the Torah. You can find that derivation in the Babylonian Talmud tractate Makot 22a. So, Ramban also wants us to know that Rabbi Ishmael, when he says, could it possibly enter your mind that people of Israel would break apart altars? He's not actually disputing. It looks like he's disputing with the, the first guy who says that this verse means you can't break apart a stone of the temple. Um, but Ramban says, Rabbi Yishmael is elaborating because, you know, you still can't break a stone off the temple. That's, all, that's also against the, the law. Um, and, you know, don't... Hey, uh, Jacob? Yeah. I, just a quick note. Uh, I was reading this morning in Leviticus 1, and it talks about 
um, when they put the tabernacle up, that when God's presence is there, that the cloud will be over the temple, over the tabernacle. And then when he lifts the cloud and begins to move, then they're to pick up and move to wherever they're to go. But when it talked about, you know, the place that God chooses, that sort of reminded me of that Leviticus 1 section. Oh, yeah. Right. So eventually it's going to be Jerusalem. Um, and that's where the, 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 the dwelling presence of God enters the temple in Jerusalem in the days of Solomon. But in the intervening time, it, it's, uh, it's in the tabernacle. Yeah, so um, when they, so it's a little bit different than that because the way that um, they figured out where to build the temple was not that the presence of God, like the cloud got up and moved and went there, and then they built the temple um, because they saw that happen. Actually, um, David picked out the the spot, it was a threshing floor in Jerusalem, and then he waited for a prophet to confirm that it was the right spot. He didn't wait for a prophet to say, hey, go build a temple and build it there. He's like, I'm going to build a temple and I'm going to build it here. Oh. And then he waited for a prophet to come and say, yeah, that's where it's supposed to be. Um, and then they built the temple and then the presence came. So it kind of went in reverse. In the wilderness, the cloud did go first and then they moved the tabernacle, I don't know, until it was like under the cloud and then that's where they were supposed to be. But in the days of the Holy Temple, which is when God finally chose the, uh, the place to place his name, the temple came first and then the dwelling presence came afterward. Interesting yes. contrast. Yes. Uh -huh. All right. I should have got a can of water. So now we have, to, he's going, I think he's going to explain the flow of the passage again from this perspective. If so, the explanation of the passage is as follows. You shall break apart their altars. You shall obliterate their names, but don't do that to Hashem. In other words, don't break apart his altar and don't obliterate his name. Rather, show respect for his name and his altar. And at the place he will choose to place an altar, eventually, for his name, you shall seek him out there and bring your burnt offerings before him. This is verse 6. Um, you bring your burnt offerings and feast offerings, your tithes and what you raise up with your hands. What does it mean to seek out his presence? Uh -huh. Um Ramban takes it quite literally because the verse is talking about the literal Shekhinah, the dwelling presence of God in the temple in Jerusalem. And so it means make sure you have good directions when you're on your way to Jerusalem. <laughs> Seek, you know, figure out how to get to Jerusalem and then go there. Um, uh, the way he words the question is, which is the road to the house of Hashem? You know, go to him from distant lands and ask the people you meet along the way, which is the road to the house of Hashem? He quotes Jeremiah 50, verses 4 and 5, which say, uh, says, uh, They will seek out Hashem, their God. They will ask the way to Zion. Their faces will be turned toward it, saying, Come, be joined to Hashem. But uh, Sifre has a different explanation which is um, seek out through the instruction of a prophet the correct site on which to build the temple. But like, I, like we just talked about, you don't wait till the prophet comes and tells you. You seek out and find on your own where the place is, and then afterward a prophet will tell you if you're correct. And that's what David did, according to Jewish tradition. Huh. All right. Verse 6. This is a toughie. There you shall bring your burnt offerings and feast offerings, your tithes and your teruma is the Hebrew word here, teruma. Now what's, what this translation has is what you raise up with your hands. It doesn't just say teruma. I mean, teruma is a word that you don't usually translate in, in Jewish law because what is teruma? It's teruma. It's just called teruma. It's like, what's Shabbat? It's Shabbat. You just use the Hebrew word. There's no, you know, it's a different word. But here they actually translate teruma really literally. And this, the reason for that is, is the, is the, well, Ramban's going to take like five pages here to explain it. Um, your tithes and what you raise up with your hands, your free will offerings, 
firstborn of your cattle and your flocks or vow, you know, vow offerings and your free will offerings, first one of your cattle and your flocks, you shall eat there before Hashem your God, and you shall rejo rejoice with your every undertaking, you and your household, as Hashem your God has blessed you. So there's a constraint here in this. This is not just, you know, reading it today, reading it today, it's easy to think, oh, obviously you bring all the offerings to Jerusalem. We know that you have to do sacrifices at the temple. You can't do them wherever you want. We've sort of read that before here in the Torah. Um, but there's, it's more than that. And verse 7 says you have to eat there. You have to eat there. Now, obviously, this is not going to be the case for burnt offering. But for many offerings, they are uh, portions of the animal are eaten. Only some of the animal is burned on the altar. Portions of the animal are eaten. And this is saying you have to eat them in Jerusalem. Now, the commentators... Look at all these words. I mean, we know what burnt offerings are. But then like feast offerings, ties, terumas, vow offerings, free will offerings, the firstborn. The, the rabbis try to clarify exactly which offerings are in view here because obviously not every, you know, I think, well, like uh, tithes, for example, it's difficult in this in this verse because you know, obviously um the tithe you the uh, master shaney is uh the tithe that you take to uh jerusalem sometimes and you have to eat it there and it's fine but um what about the poor man's tithe sometimes the, the, the sometimes uh, master shaney goes to the poor well they don't have to come to jerusalem to get it and only eat the the food in jerusalem you know, it could go to any poor person. So, so it's a little bit of clear, a little bit of clarification is needed here. Mm -hmm. So Rashi, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Jacob. I had read in a commentary that ties had to do with uh, uh, produce from the land. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, the biblical tithe is is a straight percentage of um, the harvest of agriculture yeah. of agricultural produce. Barley, wheat, what? Okay. Mm -hmm. And livestock. Yeah, you take the livestock, and you take every tenth one. Um, now, uh, because like there's observant Jews all over the world now who are not growing produce in the land of Israel. And generally speaking, they will um, give to charity uh, from their income, right? So yeah. it's, called, it's called tzedakah. And they'll give some, <laughs> some will even shoot for like a 10%. Um, but they wouldn't say that it's the tithe. The church is sort of appropriate the, the word to mean that. Right. Um, it's it, it, you. It's I think probably okay to do as long as you understand that it's not literal. It's an idiomatic use of the word tithe. Yep. It's yep. not the same thing as the biblical tithe. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, Rashi. Rashi says the tithe refers to the livestock tithe and um, the second tithe, Master Shani, the second tithe. Um, the first time my service shown goes to obviously the, the Levites, the priests get the, the tithe from that. Um, and it all goes toward, um, you know, because the Levites don't have uh, land to work, so they need to be supported with agricultural produce. Yep. But the second tithe goes, so, you know, sometimes you take it to Jerusalem and eat it during the festival. Sometimes you give it to the poor. It goes on a cycle, I think. <coughs> He'd be talking about the one you use for the festival, I think. And this word, uh, the teruma here, which literally is something raised up with the hands, or something raised up. It, it says here, um, actually, it, said, it doesn't just say teruma. It says um, teruma that you raise up with your hands which is a, is a funky word. <laughs> um, 
the mm. terum, it's teruma of your hands or the things raised up of your hands. It's, mm. So Rashi says the teruma here is referring to the first fruit offering, the kurim. As it is stated concerning them, the Kohen shall take the basket from your hand. But Ramban says, according to the plain way of interpretation, the first the verse first mentions burnt offerings, which obviously have to be brought to the, the, the temple. Feast offerings, which you're obligated to eat within Jerusalem, within the walls of Jerusalem. And then it mentions also that one should bring there the first tithe and teruma, the actual teruma, the thing that's normally called teruma in Jewish law, which is um, from every harvest you separate an amount. And actually the, the uh, percentage is not given in the Torah. Um, and you give it to the priest. It's different from the tithe. Actually, and I think it comes first. So that he may give them the, to the Kohanim and the Levites who serve there as ministers of the sanctuary. Uh, so he's saying, you know, the, where are the, where, if you're going to, you're going to bring your first tithe, then you're going to bring a teruma to the priest. Where are you going to go to find some of those people? Well, they're going to be in the, in the, in Jerusalem. They're going to be at the temple. Ramban says, it's like the idea stated in the verse, Malachi 3.10, bring all the tithes into the storage house and let it be sustenance in my temple. Test me, if you will, with this, said Hashem Tzavahot. See if I do not open up for you the windows of the heavens and pour out upon you the blessing without end. And so did the institute concerning Truma and um, Truma Smaser, which is the... Uh, 10th of the 10th, right? The Levites get the, the tithe, and then they have to tithe from that to the priest. It's, it's called Terumat Maser. So they institute concerning Teruma and Terumat Maser in the second temple period that they brought to the temple and distributed to the Kohanim there. So if you don't make the priest come to you to get it, you take it over to the priest. As it states in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1038, that we would bring the first of our dough and our Teruma and the fruits of every tree of wine and olive oil to the Kohanim, to the chambers of the temple of our God. And it states further, and the Levites shall bring up the tithe of the tithe to the temple of our God, to the chambers of the storage house. In the next verse there. So that's the plain interpretation. This is just Teruma. And you, you should, uh, the Teruma goes to the priest, so bring it to the priest. You know? Now, why is it called Teruma of your hands? Teruma Yedchem. Yedchem or Yedechem. I can never remember the rules for whether Schwa is pronounced or not. Um, well, the explanation of this, this uh, with your hands is that the Torah didn't give a minimum amount for Teruma. It's just as much as your hand raises up. Okay. Now, first tithe and teruma can be eaten anywhere. First tithe and teruma belong to the priest, but the priest doesn't have to eat them in Jerusalem. So this is a little bit of an issue because, you know, because you have to eat it in Jerusalem. You get to a verse, when you get to verse 17, your outlying cities, you may not eat the tithe of your grain, your wine, your oil, the firstborn of your cattle, your flocks, your vow offerings that you vow, and your free will offerings, that which you raise up with your hands. So this is Teruma. Well, we know we know under Jewish law, Teruma is not restricted to be only being eaten in, um, in Jerusalem. So what does that verse mean? Well, Ramban says... It means that the, if you're an Israelite and you set apart some teruma or you, you separated your tithe, don't eat it. <laughs> um, whatever, the, whatever things that, are, that you can eat that you have to eat in Jerusalem, eat in Jerusalem. You know, say the sacrificial meat and so forth. But uh, all the different rules concerning those things are not repeated here because you can find them in other places in the Torah. 
Now Rambam presents a third interpretation in which uh, Teruma has a completely different meaning. And I think that's why it's translated here in this translation, what is raised up with the hands instead of just calling it Teruma. Because Ramban has given some possibilities, but he's going to now give his real opinion. You think, but I think insofar as the play meaning of this verse is concerned, the Teruma of your hands refers to what a person raises up to God from his silver and gold to make it or to purchase a burnt offering or feast offering. In stating the term of your hands, your vow offerings, your free will offerings, the verse is enumerating three different types of voluntary offering. Vow offerings, which is when you say, I hereby accept upon myself to bring an ox or a lamb or a goat. A free will offering, which is when you say, I hereby accept upon myself to bring this goat or this lamb or this ox. The animal is actually designated. Um, and the third kind of offering in view here is the teruma that you raise up. In other words, anything that you have, gold or silver and a non-consecrated animal, and you just bring it to the temple and you donate it or the upkeep of the temple or to, uh, no, actually to apply the money toward a sacrifice, not for the upkeep of the temple, but toward a sacrifice. And then Ramban gives, Ramban gives examples of other places in the Torah where the word teruma is used for monetary donation, and there are several. Now, why in this situation does it say teruma of your hands instead of just teruma? Well, in this explanation, it actually makes more sense because teruma of your hands is a hint that it doesn't mean teruma. It doesn't mean the portion separated from the, the crop just to give to the priest. It, it's a different meaning of the word teruma. Thus, according to this explanation, Ramban says, all the items mentioned require that they be eaten within the enclosure. But for the meaning of your tithes is the livestock tithe and the second tithe, which are always eaten in Jerusalem, does not refer to the, the poor man's tithe or the first tithe, and of course, meat from an offering must be eaten in Jerusalem. All right. Verse 8. You shall not do like everything that we do here today, every man with his proper in his eyes, for you have not yet come to the resting place or to the heritage that Hashem your God gives you. Even Ezra says... Yeah, Ibn Ezra has a, a couple of interpretations. Ibn Ezra says that he heard from somebody else, or he read somewhere else, that, well, they were traveling from destination to destination in the wilderness. A person is, might offer a burnt offering at any one of those places that, the, that they had been encamped. And some people were giving their firstborn of the flock to the Kohen. Some people were not because the commandment didn't actually come into force until they arrived in the land. However, even Ezra continues, I don't agree with this opinion. Rather, what it means is that not everybody in the wilderness was God-fearing. Everyone was doing, you know, um, they were committing sins. And because Moses said we... And Moses was not implicating himself because he was not committing sins. We must explain that he said this also because there are many commandments that are dependent on the land. So like, even as we saw a dual meaning here, which is generally not a good idea in Jewish interpretation, you're expected to derive a commandment from one place. Um, well, this isn't a commandment, though. To get more than one meaning out of, out of a verse is totally kosher. It happens all the time. Um, But Ramban rejects this interpretation. He says, it's not sound, for it is not the manner of the rest of the passage for Moses to be speaking admonishments. It's not what God is, or that's not what Moses is really talking about right now. They should say to them now that they are not following God's commandments, and instead each man is doing what is right in his own eyes. Furthermore, how could our teacher Moses say we do? 
concerning sins. Rather, it would have been fitting for him to say, you shall not do like everything that you've been doing until today. Each man what is proper in his eyes. And furthermore, what sense is there in grouping together with actual sins, the non-fulfillment of commandments that are dependent on the land? However, the explanation of the verse is that the people of Israel had been commanded in the wilderness to slaughter all of their cattle and flocks before the tabernacle as peace offerings. However, wherever the tabernacle was, you know, one could make them. You could just go to the tabernacle. It was always pretty close by because everyone camped around it. If one did not wish to eat meat, he was not obligated to bring a sacrifice at all. Also, he was not obligated to bring his firstborn animals to the Kohen, nor the livestock tithe, nor the second tithe. None of those precepts were operative in the wilderness. He didn't actually ever have to bring anything to the tabernacle. Even on the pilgrimage festivals, you didn't have to go to the tabernacle. Likewise, even when you did a peace offering, after the sprinkling of the blood and the burning of the fat, you could take that and eat it wherever you wanted. There was no, you didn't have to stay in a specific enclosed area. You could even take them outside the camp. Thus, the people had no obligation at all in the entire matter of sacrifices. Rather, every man would do what was proper in his own eyes. Therefore, Moses commanded here that after they come to the resting place or to the heritage that they should not continue to operate in that fashion they will have to come to a known and specified place chosen by God, and they will have to bring the feast offerings, tithes, and firstborn animals and eat them there within the required enclosure, which is the city of Jerusalem, before God. You shall cross the Jordan and settle in the land that Hashem, your God, causes you to inherit, and he will give you rest from all your enemies all around, and you will dwell securely shall be that in the place where Hashem your God will choose to rest his name, there shall you bring everything that I command you. And it goes on and on, and uh, it was very specific to say that uh, all the offerings must be brought to the temple in Jerusalem. It doesn't say temple in Jerusalem, but, it, but it, it's, it refers to it in future tense, that there's going to be a place, and then that's going to be the place. And then, of course, it relaxes the restriction on eating uh, meat. Not all meat, once they enter the land, not all meat has to be part of a sacrifice. You can just kill an animal and eat it. Is that repeated or is that? Mm. Okay, let's, so let's read um, from verse 15 to 16, because I think that's going to be important. However, in your soul's desire, you may slaughter and eat meat according to the blessing that Hashem your God will have given you in all your cities. The contaminated one and the pure one may eat it like the deer and the heart. But you shall, not, you shall not eat the blood. You shall pour it onto the earth like water. Okay, we're going to need to know those verses for Ramban's next comment. Verse 20, when Hashem your God will broaden your boundary as he spoke to you and you say, I would eat meat for you will have a desire to eat meat. To your heart's entire desire may you eat meat, because the place that Hashem your God will choose to place his name will be far from you. You may slaughter from your cattle and your flocks that Hashem has given you, as I've commanded you, and you may eat in your cities according to your heart's entire desire. However, just as the deer and the heart are eaten, so shall you eat it. The contaminated one and the pure one may eat it together. It does, it does repeat all of this stuff from the previous passage. Only be strong not to eat the blood, for the blood it is the life, and you shall not eat the life with the meat. You shall not eat it. You shall pour it onto the ground like water. You shall not eat it, in order that it may be well with you and your children after you when you do what is right in the eyes of Hashem. Okay. Meat of desire. First of all, what is this broadening of the boundary? There's a couple of things that are called broadening the boundary. One of them is a little bit more specific from chapter 19. And it's referring to a point in the distant future. Ramban says this is not what this verse is talking about. It's talking about once they conquered the, the land of Canaan occupied by the seven nations. Not the larger area occupied by ten nations, but just once they get into the land of Canaan uh, of the seven nations and do the apportioning of the lands to the tribes. After that, 
meat of desire becomes permitted. Now it says here that the reason is because the place the Hashem your God will choose to place his name is far from you. In other words, every time you want a hamburger, you have to go to Jerusalem, even if you live in the Negev or up by Lebanon. This is not going to be, you know, it's going to be a, a real pain in the butt. But, yeah. but what if you live in Jerusalem and the temple's right there? Does that mean you have to go and do the sacrifice instead of just killing the animal and eating it? because you're not far from the place that God will choose to place his name? Raman says, no, it's the same rule for everybody. Even if you live in Jerusalem, you can eat meat of desire. Boy, the thing that confuses me is where it says the clean and the unclean. Yeah, so in the wilderness, after, after a certain point, Moses said, you can't eat, you can't just kill an animal and eat the meat anymore because you're not actually doing that, you're secretly sacrificing these animals to goat demons. So all meat, if you wanna kill an animal and eat it, you have to bring it to the temple and offer it as a peace offering. And you still get to eat most of it, the priest gets a portion. Um, however, when you're, when you're, when you're uh, doing an animal sacrifice, well, you have to eat that meat in a state of ritual purity. Now, Moses is clarifying here that a clean person or an unclean person, you know, an unclean person is allowed to eat food. They're just not allowed to eat sacrificial meat. So because now this meat that Moses is talking about, the meat of desire is not going to be sacrificial meat. He's clarifying that, yes, if you're unclean, you'll be able to eat meat. In the wilderness, if you were unclean, you wouldn't oh. have been able to eat meat. You would have had to eat just vegetables or, or something. Right. All, all of the meat was sacrificial meat at that time in the wilderness. So we're talking about the, the person, unclean or, or clean. I was thinking yes. of the... Oh, okay. Duh. <laughs> Good question, though, because it is a little confusing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Depending on the translation, this one's pretty clear. The contaminated one and the pure one may eat it together. So it's... Mm. The, person, the, un the unclean person will be able to eat meat as long as it's not sacrificial meat. Got it. What is this? Um, well, let me see if I can find it again here. Oh, here, uh, here we go. In verse 21, it says, you may slaughter from your cattle and your flocks that Hashem has given you, as I have commanded you. You may slaughter as I have commanded you. Yeah. So this is, you know, in Jewish interpretation, a big clue that there is a right and a wrong way to slaughter an animal. Yeah. And the right way to slaughter an animal is to slaughter the way that God commanded. Well, you search, you could search the whole Torah in vain for uh, a specific procedure on slaughtering an, an, an animal. For sacrifices, there's some detail what to do with the blood and so forth, but it's never, it's never like really specifically laid out. And of course, in Jewish law, it's very specific. And a shochet or someone who is uh, who ritually slaughters animals uh, has to be a real Torah scholar in all of the areas that have to do with uh, shechita, which is the, hey. the mm -hmm. shechita is what is what the, the the method of slaughter under Jewish law is called shechita. Um, mm -hmm. So Ramban, the Ramban says the meaning of you may slaughter as I have commanded you according to the opinion of our sages of blessed memory is as I have commanded you orally by means of a law communicated to Moses from Mount Sinai. So it's the uh, Torah Sheba al I think is what it's called, the, the, the oral Torah. It's an oral tradition that goes back, uh, according to observant Jews, goes back to Sinai. This teaches that Moses was commanded regarding the esophagus and trachea. Right, so Shochet, so when he's slaughtering an animal, uh, according to this method, must sever, I think it was more than half of both of those um, tubes in the case of like a mammal. So you have to be able to tell, is it more than 50% um, 
50% is not enough. It has to be more than 50% uh, uh, cut through. There's many other traditions and customs. That's not the only um, aspect of shechita. Um, Chocolate. It's, uh, you know, they use a specific kind of knife and so forth. Mm. Has mm. to be a certain length. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, of uh, laws around that. Now you should know, Ramban says, you should know the term shechita um, refers specifically to severing the esophagus and trachea and not to killing in general. So when you see in the Torah that, you know, God slaughtered people in the wilderness, for example, that's used metaphorically. He didn't actually cut their esophagus is in tracheas. Um, he slaughtered them as if they were as if, like 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 you would slit the throat of a sheep um, mm -hmm. not having any mercy whatsoever. Now scripture had previously commanded regarding sacrifices he shall slaughter they shall slaughter um, same Hebrew roots same verb which again is a reference to slaughtering by severing the tubes of the neck now, originally, God had commanded that whatever meat the Israelites eat must be from animals brought as peace offerings, which were, of course, slaughtered according to the law of sacrifices. So now when God came to permit non-sacrificial meat, he said, you may slaughter as I commanded you when they were required to be brought as sacrifices. To, in other words, you have to kill them the same way. But then you may eat them as non-sacrificial meat according to your heart's entire de uh, desire. So he's permitting consumption of these animals anywhere as long as they're slaughtered in this, using the same method as the slaughter of a sacrificial animal. Shechita. Mm -hmm. Sages also said in Sifri, just as sacrificial animals must be killed through shechita, so too non-consecrated animals must be killed through shechita. Yeah. Thus, the basic commandment of slaughtering animals with shechita is explicit here and is elaborated from the words of our sages through oral tradition. But this is sort of the hook in the Torah on which the laws of shechita uh, hang. They're not just made up. There is a. It, it does indicate in the Torah that there is a right way to do it. So. Yeah. Um, All right. You know, I question Jacob um, when. Yeshua was having his disciples prepare the place for his final Seder. Hmm. I don't know, maybe I'm spiritualizing it, but he used the term, go to the place that I have chosen. And hmm. I, I, I just took that like we're reading here, the place, the place, the place, um, like you're meeting God at that place. Um, I don't know, I'm just sharing yeah. a thought really meant a lot to me uh, and yeah. on the yeah am i off base or does that make a little bit of sense well if there's a connection it's a mystical connection uh -huh. i did read i did read in sefer haba here have, have. something about a place um sham mm. uh, the sham is the hebrew word for place i think and um there was there was a deep mystical significance to that <clears throat> And it ends up, um, well, it ends up being very hard to explain. It's something that I would have to go back and read again and study again. Uh, uh -huh. um, but it, but that it did. You, what you said reminded me of that. Um, yeah, I have I'd love heard to know what you say like. that it happened on the Temple Mount. That his stating that kind of was referencing that. God th that they had it in that upper colonnade of Solomon that is where that last um, oh. meal occurred nice. and also where they were for um, Sh like Shavuot yeah I think it definitely is where they were for Shavuot I don't know uh, about the Seder though that's a good question I don't I've never actually I've never heard that before but it might be yeah, because he said you'll see a man entering with a pot of water or something to that effect for the last Seder. Um, okay. 
But anyway, hey, one more thing before you leave and have lunch. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, Buffalo Farms are near us here. Um, we're not too far from um, Angola, uh, up by Angola Way. But um, we were there one time taking the tour and this in Indian man was giving all the directions. I said, is the buffalo kosher? I was just trying to see what he would say. And by golly, he grabbed that word and he said, no. And I'll tell you why. He said, the buffalo won't hold still long enough. Huh. And I thought, wow. <laughs> he knew what I, <laughs> yeah. Because wow, they do yeah. have buffalo meat there, but. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I bet someone could figure out a way to make a buffalo hold still. <laughs> well, maybe oh. it's not maybe it's not worth the effort. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's for sure. <laughs> oh shoot. Well, wow. that's good. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Thank you, Jacob, thanks, very Jake. much. Thank you. Yep. For all your study.